Well, we had a special hunt in the family in the uh, in the last several days. Uh, actually, two of them, uh, three of them, if you count my public land in Pennsylvania. But he, there's this one's even more important. Um, you know, we have just had a video out on Thursday talking about un hunting unpressured food plots and the value of that. And we're going to show you what can happen when you have unpressured food plots. And it's awesome because when you get into gun season, I, I've seen some uh, Facebook posts lately and social media. Uh, uh, Wisconsin harvest is down, Buffalo County, Trempolo County, uh, Michigan harvest is down at the bridge, Michigan harvest overall. Well, especially in Wisconsin, when the opening day is as far back as it can be, it was the 23rd this year. Uh, last year was the 17th. The rut by the 17th is really winding down. By the 23rd, it's basically non-existent except for some random deer here, doe here and there, they'll come into heat. So that affects if, if hunters are going out and they're relying on a bunch of does to bring a buck by, on opening day a gun, it's probably not gonna happen unless they're in a spot where they, those deer wanna stay during the fall. It's thick, it's browse, it's um, escape cover. And if you don't have those quality fall food sources, those bucks are in recovery mode by the 23rd of November. Maybe not the 17th, but definitely the 23rd. So as the season progresses in the 23rd of November, the end of November, early December, some really cool things happen. Because if you have high quality food that you're hunting, it doesn't matter if you're on public land or private land, if you have quality cover, um, high stem count cover, maybe a mix of conifer thrown in here and there, but not solid conifer. Um, you have diversity of habitat, maybe some grass, a switch grass, open fields where there's some browse, and it's unpressured. Then by the end of gun season, you can really suck some major deer into, into that area. Unfortunately, 90% of the habitat out there is highly pressured by the time that, that rolls around Thanksgiving time. And then there's a lot of areas, that, big open hardwoods that don't have good quality food sources or good quality cover. They kind of go hand in hand, especially daytime browse cover. So if you find those unpressured areas, unpressured habitat, not just food, food sources, but both. And then you add in the fact that everyone's out there and pushing. There's very few acreage left over, private or public, that's unpressured and has quality fall food and cover. Now, Another factor starts to take place end of November, early December. For all those people that missed the rut, which was really good the 10th, the 9th, the 5th, the 3rd, but not the 15th and certainly not the 23rd, the secondary rut comes into play early December, whether people believe it or not. Obviously, not all those are bred in the primary rut. Uh, a lot of those are missed. And then you have those fawns coming in. Well, that pushes a lot of that breeding for the second rut back into that early December time frame. We had a beautiful buck come into our lap, Dylan and I, last year filming. I believe it was around the 4th of December, 5th of December, sometime in that time frame. It could have been the 3rd. But uh, he was chasing a doe. Doe came over first right in our lap. Then the buck came over right, right there. And after we shot him, he actually was alive about 20 seconds later going down. And he was still on that doe track. I mean, he's still looking, I think, for doe. I mean, they have such strong intact instincts for that rutting behavior that when you get a few does coming into estrus early December, you find unpressured food source, unpressured cover, and you can sit back and watch it all happen, then really, really good things happen. Now, we have a story with a split prowl buck, and we're going to talk about the ending of that buck here shortly. And uh, we actually have a special guest with us today too, but before that, the split prowl. Uh, three, three seasons ago, I was able to pass him three times. One time he came down with a fawn during the second rut when I was with my muzzleloader, came right down into a lower food plot going to a water hole. And uh, he had hit one of his left main tines busted off, maybe even his beam, I can't remember, but he was busted up, he's a fighter. I elected to pass on him then because I felt at that point he was gonna make it through the season and he was a beautiful buck. Well, last year I would have loved to have shot that buck. I ended up shooting a different buck, which is fine too. He was beautiful last year, he had the same split brow I believe on, on his uh, left side. Well, during gun season, muzzleloader, I had him come down to me and the split brow was broke off. So here's a heavy buck wide coming at me and I'm looking down at him as he's going down below me. I thought I'd get a better look when he got down low and in the spot, but he took a cut and went up into the woods, went by a trail camera and we got a picture. But it was him. He had just broken off from fighting his split brow. Well, this year he really blew up into a beautiful six-year-old. Uh, split brows on both sides, an acorn on his right G2, just, you know, big body antlers. He was just the perfect mature buck. And he wasn't a booner, but we don't really care about that. We care about age around here. Um, I don't care if he's six years old and 140, 135, or 160. We're going to shoot him or try to shoot him. And um, he was our number one target buck. We had one buck that walked by a trail camera 
um, just in the last couple of weeks that was larger. We had some other ones, the G2 buck, um, the wideout buck. I know I'm going to forget some other bucks. Um, you know, I shot a nice 10 point. Um, we had the big heavy 10, which we'll tell you about that in a second. But, uh, you know, it was really, uh, really a focus of ours. And my wife, Diane, she has never shot a buck before. And so I was actually really hoping she would shoot the split brow. She had an opportunity to him last year. Um, she couldn't find him. You know, he's moving in between brush and as a newer hunter. Um, I'll say it. Uh, I don't know if she will because she is our special guest here today. But um, she sat about 45 times last year and about, about the same this year. And I'm not saying that to diminish her hunts or anything. Uh, she looks at it like, don't tell people that I sat so many times before I got something. I'm telling you that because of the determination and hard work that she put in. Over the last two years, who do you know that sat 85 to 90 times in 23 different stands and blinds on three properties, often going up 35 to 40 minutes in the morning to hunt particular rut stands or way up high and and then uh, sitting in temperatures that were between zero and 10 degrees often for four to five hours at a time staying in a stand because she just knew a big buck would come by she had opportunities at mature bucks that she really taught her a lot of lessons of hunting she learned so much in the last two years and on top of that Gunnar Hansen works with us really hard on the properties local I think he's 19 or 20 right now works very very hard worker but Diane is really our hardest worker um, on the property, my buddy Rich comes out for a weekend, but consistently Diane's helping me with seeding, with maintaining trail cameras. She's helped me put a lot of tree stands in. Two days before the season, we went up into an open wood area and we brought a uh, Family Traditions 15-foot um, ladder stand hole. Her and I carried it uphill. 30, it's a 30-minute walk to get to that stand location regardless of whether we're bringing a stand in with us or not. So very hard work in all areas of the property she has to listen to all my stuff talking about whitetails and i am bragging about her a little bit because i'm proud of her this year with our main focus of that split brow buck guess what happened babe <laughs> what uh you shot him so that was it though she just went out and shot him that's the end of the story but uh so you know leading up to it all the hard work she put in um she has her own 243 she has her own scope range finder binoculars um she has all the clothing everything she's very fortunate with all that stuff and so that's helped her manage her sits and stay you know without a redneck blind sometimes i'm not sure she would have gone out i really don't know um but she's been tough a lot of the a lot of the cold sits bow she's been in a tree stand um, and then we start using the rednecks a lot more going into right now. She sat in the rednecks in the early season hunting. And, you know, I'm going to let you talk for a little bit. I'll ask you some questions. She, she normally doesn't like being on camera at all. So this is, but this is a special moment. I mean, it's special for our family, um, for a th three year quest with this buck. And uh, let's tell us a little bit about it. I mean, hey, did you even want to go hunting last Friday after Thanksgiving? No. Absolutely not. Why? I gave you a hard time. Um, I just, I, the last couple of times I've sat, it's all those. Fun to watch, but I don't, I just didn't really think, I don't know. It came coming, like leading up to it on, did we sit Wednesday before Thanksgiving, Wednesday evening? I think so. She mostly sits by herself, but we sat together and uh, was it 16 does and phones yeah, we saw? Lots of And dogs. so I told her, I'm like, man, with everything else being pressured with having that food source with the secondary rut coming, seeing a lot of does and we're not spooking them is a good thing. Yes. So, so even you didn't want to go out, but yeah. so what time did you go out? And I, and I told her, I said, but I don't even know what time I went out. How long did you sit for? I only sat for like an hour before you saw, oh, well, and you had planned like a two hour sit. Yeah, well, like a two, two twenty. In the, in the way we position our rednecks, you can get in and out of them with using the hills. Um, without spooking deer. Dylan and I are going out and sitting in the redneck tonight. Uh, the same redneck because we're because it's so lucky now that it's been christened <laughs> with Diane's incredible success that uh, we'll we'll see something big. I'm sure it's got to be the G2 or that new one that came through, or that goofy one that has the brow tines that go like this and he's that comes up high that I passed up near and bow that I probably shouldn't have with the big growth on his neck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she's yeah, gonna bring saw, us luck. I saw a couple of bucks that night. I mean two. I think bucks were the first things that came out into the front food pot, like and two, um, how long do you think, two, two and a half year olds. How long before dark do you think it was? When I shot? No, when you set, first started seeing deer. About an hour? About an hour. So you started getting excited because the bucks came out first. And so 
And I was traveling to Pennsylvania hunting public land. I was, I was probably already 12 hours, 10 hours into the trip, something like that. And so I start getting calls from her in the blind. Yeah. Because she's, she's starting to get excited. I'm excited because there's two bucks. I didn't think they were shooters. I passed up a lot of younger bucks. And all of a sudden, a couple of does came running down onto the plot. And it was a big buck chasing it. But he was on the outskirts. Tall. 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 And, um, Which we have a story about that one in a second. So but then I yeah. was excited and he started going towards, you know, getting off the prop, like going up and around to the other food plot I was hoping. At the same time, I'm kind of watching him. I looked over to my left food plot and there's a huge buck over there. And it's, you know, good and what, two, two and what were you, yards. And what were you doing yards. at that moment? I, I called Jeff. <laughs> so, so she's... And I was... She's in part of it's because I was. Yeah, and it's not like you know she's calling me for any other reason other than she's just so excited and she's like she's calling me and you could hear the nervousness in her voice and she's hunted so hard and she's been educated so much <laughs> by mature box different. Yeah. And so um, and she's picky. She says they're small box that could be like a two year old box, maybe even a three year old. We we've had two year olds go by where she didn't shoot. Um, so but she I, just thought for her first buck she wanted to i didn't fully think i mean i knew he was a mature buck did not know who he was at the time he was kind of far tons of does are on the plot um he was wide and heavy so that I got me tell him wide and heavy and he's like uh what are you doing on the phone with me shoot him I, me back. yeah i said get off the phone <laughs> <laughs> but so. at the time a doe was behind i would have shot but a doe was right behind him and i told jeff yeah. that's when he said get off the phone get a shot and so she had already prepared for that shot she had a shooting stick in there and it was 235 yards and she's like at 100 yards dead on i mean i have a she shot the muzzle lower last year that was sighted in and then when she shot it the first shot it was a quarter inch off dead center and it's you know she, she's a pretty good shot uh, crossbow good shot too so it she made the shot and i bet you it was it seemed like an attorney to her but she called me back in a minute it's just like <laughs> i shot and it was I was so excited, and so then it's uh, what it do, you know, because as somebody who hasn't shot, she shot two does before she shot a doe last year with a rifle and with a crossbow the year before. So I'm asking questions. One of the things I asked is there were a lot of does out there, and I asked her when, he, when she shot, did he just run off, and then the does all of a sudden ran off because he was running off, or did they all run off at the same time at the shot? And, and the reason I'm asking that is because if he reacted first and ran off, then likely he was hit and then the doe was followed and that's that's what they did and so she's sending me a picture she like circled in the picture you know like where <laughs> she thought he was standing so as i asked her that and so after the shot what do you do he ran uphill stopped you know a couple seconds looked around and then kept going and that was one thing i wondered too because a lot of deer that are missed they'll go up and they'll stand and they'll stand for four or five seconds, um, 10 seconds. And they'll just look around. And, but he didn't. It was a second, two second. And it's kind of like look around real quick and then go. And so he was, he was gone. Um, but at that point, I was, I was questioning myself. I mean, I had him in my sight perfect, but then I questioned everything. I and so I'm getting nervous. And I'm on the road. You know, she's doing all this on her own. Um, which, like I said, probably 80% of her hunts are by herself. The one, the hunts she don't, she doesn't like as much. The the ones she do not like is when I come along. <laughs> so when she's by herself, she's in her comfort zone. She has everything spread out. It doesn't matter if she's in the tree or in the blind. She's got everything just perfect. And um, and so uh, she had to rely on, you know, I I had her wait till dark um, to. Uh, get out of the blind and those I mean after my shot within a minute those were right back on the plot which I thought was crazy and then that made me think maybe I didn't hit him but those and those two little bucks came back and and I looked at that's why she know, did I hit him have, I still had light so I just sat yeah. there everything going through my mind but and so I had her sit till dark and the way those plots work and being unpressured is that 
um, at dark they move off and go to the ag land. So the people around us don't see those deer and they'd have to be, see them after dark because um, they're holding in our little small pocket of food and then they're gone. They feed twice at night for their fourth and fifth feedings of the day out in the ag land. And then uh, they sometimes hit the plots a little bit in the morning, but not much. And then they feed twice back in their bedding areas. They feed five times in a 24-hour period. And that third most important feeding is what we're watching. And um, they get off the plots. So after they get off the plots, we get out and not spook deer. So we rarely, if ever, spook deer when we're seeing We can almost sit out there every day, depending on the winds. We have two rednecks on either side, uh, a ghillie and then a, a hard side one in that location. So then I, I thought she would have made a good hit. Um, just the way she told me, she said she felt steady. Um, you felt like you made a good shot. I and, did feel like I made a good shot. Yeah, and, and she usually doesn't waver. If she doesn't, if she, if she thinks she made a bad shot, then she'd let me know. But she, I asked her how well she held on them. She held well. So after dark, they waited a couple hours, and she went with uh, Dante, my stepson, and, um, and, Alec. and then Alec uh, Moyer. They went in to help her, and they went in, and right away they just heard some rustling and up around where he might have gone, and they got out of there. We had a lot of rain and snow coming, and so I wanted to see if they had a shot. I felt it was safe that because of the bull um, and the way the bench was, I thought they could at least go back and just see if there's any hair, any blood on the snow before the rain came, just to have any indication, and they'd be hidden um, in that location um, without going all the way up and, uh, or you know past the bench. So they went back in and still nothing. And, no uh, hair, no blood. Ben but I kept, kept asking her, what did the does do on the shot? How would he react to the shot? The does came back. He wasn't with them. He's the king out there. Um, we've seen him during daylight. We have lots of daylight footage of him out there. I didn't go to sleep excited that I'm going to find him. I went to sleep more sad that I missed them, Yeah. that I could have missed them. But. So what happened when you went out in the morning? Tell the, tell the when story. Out in the morning, I wasn't even that excited because I was like, oh, I hope I didn't wound him. I, you know, totally might have missed him. And right when we got in, I wanted to go kind of look exactly where he was standing because from that far away, I wanted to gauge it. And Alec and Dante went, they didn't say anything, but Alec couldn't sleep that night. He said it, the, the sound he heard, he was pretty sure the buck was going to be where he heard it. Didn't give me any, any indication, so I was walking, looking for my, uh, any hair, blood, and all of a sudden they came down, I heard a little whistle. Dante was already on the phone with Mr. Jeff, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they didn't look at me, I just walked to them and got over there. And she doesn't call me Mr. Jeff, her, her <laughs> son does. <laughs> the kids, when we were little, we called Miss Diane and Mr. Jeff, so anyways. So walked up, uh, Dante didn't look up. All of a sudden, Alec looked up at me and said, you got yourself a buck. And just pure joy, excitement. I can't even explain the way I felt. I was so excited. So excited. You could, you could hear the tears in her, well, in her voice was, um, just over the phone. I mean, I never was I'd able to push the phone around to the right location in Pennsylvania. And Dante called me first. I could barely hear other than they found it and they thought it was split brow. And oh, he thought that? Yeah. They didn't have any clue. It I was know. heavy, oh, okay. and yeah. Yeah, 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 I was asking them which buck, and they just knew it was heavy and big, and <laughs> so that was one I'd already thought, and... I was very impressed that they went up to the location, and it was still 30 yards, 20 yards. Yeah, they just saw antlers. They just saw antlers and backed out, came and got me, so I could be the first in the walk. And yeah, so she... I was so nervous and excited. I didn't even want to find it. I kept just kept telling them, point me, where is that? And uh, sure enough, I found them. <laughs> so Diane got to experience what a lot of hunters do, whether it was, a, she would have been probably just as happy if it was one of our medium-sized ones or bigger, but this was a special buck. Yes. But yeah, having the, uh, even, um, so they took it to the butcher when I was gone and, you know, she got a couple fist pumps and congratulations <laughs> and some of the guys that were up there, road workers stopped by and looked at it. Uh, she got to bring the cape up to our taxidermist, Matt Tainer, and uh, up in, uh, um, Westby and uh, she did that on her own too and so then I came home with my my buck last night and it's uh it's been a good hunting season yeah and then uh you know we'll, we'll talk about the other buck in a second but one of the first things that she said I don't know if it was Saturday you know after they found it and <laughs> or Sunday what did you ask me 
when can I go hunting again? <laughs> have a bow tag. So she went by, and, and what did you tell Matt Tainer, the taxidermist? That when you're getting, she's I getting felt, cocky, folks. Uh, <laughs> so no, that's what I said. I was like, oh, I felt like maybe I got cocky because I told him I still have my bow tag, so you'll probably be seeing me again. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it. I love it. Went from oh, I don't even want to go out tonight to the roller coaster of thinking you missed, and then to find it. I mean, we a lot of us that have hunted a while have been there, and to find that buck, I mean, she was, I was so happy for her. Um, a lot of people asked me if I wish I would have shot it, and no, because she shot that buck, and right away she wants to go out hunting again. She wants to use her tag, and that'll, you know, a lot of times people say, well, you can get spoiled with a buck like that, and we have other bucks that could be bigger, you know, depending on, and she has a long time to hunt, you know, ahead of her. She's young. No. I married young. <laughs> so, <laughs> six weeks? <laughs> but anyways, um, but yeah, she uh, she has a long time in front of her, and I think it actually fueled her. Um, she's said, um, what would you say about the excitement? You know, that you've never really... No, it just... Never really felt it. It lasted forever. It like, she's never so felt exciting. this kind of excitement in, yes. in her life. You know, like, to, and so... Um, I, I asked about the birth of her kids and she said, uh, <laughs> it, it hurt and I was tired or something like that. <laughs> After that, it was good, but yeah, it's, oh, yeah. it's a Excited. different, different type difference. of, so this was something that I think it fueled her for being a hunter for life. She'd already worked her tail off for two years. If that wasn't an example enough, um, not only hunting, but during the, the entire off season. And she put, I had to put up with me talking about all this stuff all the time. My most proud to that. No offense, but you weren't there. <laughs> yeah, I am <laughs> and too. And I did everything on my own. And yeah, I mean, he was out of state, so I had to do everything, you know, well, with Dante and Alec by my side. But and they were so awesome. I yeah, mean, they just helped with everything. Well, so. and, and not to diminish Dante and Alec, or Dante's, but Dante, our third or fourth best buck, um, big heavy ten point. I actually have a video on Instagram that has him it's got like twenty thousand views or thirty thousand something like that but people love that buck because he's got so much mass well dante ended up um he was able to uh you know and i'll back up i did shoot him in the shoulder this year and um it uh, we had pictures of him video four days later 11 days later um we think that's the buck that diane saw friday night well sunday he was bedded down and we're not sure how well he was doing but um, Dante was able to sneak up on him, and when he was starting to get up, Dante shot him and put him down. And so real proud of Dante to, for, to sneak up on him and, and shoot him, and I was so happy that Dante was able to get him. Uh, the wound looked kind of festered, but the inside, the meat was good, so we really don't know. Uh, but he was bedded down, and, and uh, maybe he was just rutted out. But uh, so for Dante experience. to get that on Sunday and then... <laughs> And here just, and look at the expert, <laughs> uh, the expert field dresser here. At that point, now she she helped field dress with Dante. I only watched. Just the two of them. That. Yeah, and life was a little bit dull, but we <laughs> got through it, and it was a good bonding experience with me and Dante. Yeah, and, and that's kind of what it's all about. We just and did it all together. You know, the the bonding experience even between Diane and I the last couple of years and being able to hunt together um, has been incredible. I mean, that's drawn us closer. Yeah. Uh, being able to hunt together. Um, uh, at the same time, none of this would have happened without those unpressured food sources and unpressured cover combinations. And, you know, one of these bucks, it's one of the ones behind me up here, big 160-inch buck. It was a six-year-old. That was shot the ninth day of gun season um, with my bow. Um, I shot another buck out there the seventh day of gun season with Sam. Shot another one the fourth day of gun season. Jake shot a really nice buck that was a half rack. Um, during muzzleloader season, um, I had an opportunity on a monster buck uh, several years ago that I missed on muzzleloader 75 yards. I, I admittedly jerked it over its back. I've shot bucks that were bigger at that time, but he's at least 160 inch eight point. And um, so we've had in other encounters too, and um, and great hunts. But we've had some great opportunities on open food source. Diane was able to see you saw split brow last year, and then you weren't sure if it was him. Yeah, yeah, on the food plot and didn't, wasn't sure if it was him. Yeah, and we got a video right after I walked by her. That's what a lot of people don't get to experience. Um, not only do not, you know, most people not hunt the secondary rut, but they don't plan for it. So if, if you're overpressuring your land, you don't get to see the secondary rut. 
But if you have unpressured food, unpressured cover, uh, whether you're hunting on public land or not, I had scrape by me out on Pennsylvania this last weekend. Um, when I went in on Monday, um, scrape had opened up in the snow. And so I was very excited because the second rut, and sure enough, I shot my buck when he was coming through with some does. Um, so a lot of people don't get to experience that. Uh, how many lands are overpressured? How many uh, lands don't have that kind of deer herd on them because they've been spooked out, pressured during the hunting season, let alone food plots. Food plots can kill you and kill your land if you've overpressured because then it spooks out your bedding areas, the travel to from bedding to food, and it's done. So we had a great late season, post opening day, food source, unpressured cover hunt. Dante had a great hunt and I'm proud of you, babe. This is awesome. So happy. I'm still on a high. Yeah. So I hope you guys enjoyed it.